I was told that I'm going to have to stay on this rug, which is going to be really, really difficult. Um, but the beautiful thing about that is that, so if I sort of have this kind of like, you know, just sort of rain man moment, I apologize. Um, oh, that's not, can we go to the first slide? Um, wow, I've just, I've, just, I've just buried my lead. Um, so, oh, I'll just do it. Doink. Hey, here's everything I'm going to say. <laughs> there. <laughs> So the beautiful thing and why I have to do it though and why that um, as amazing as, as this whole day has been and just sort of full of thought my brain is at this point is that if I don't do it I'm going to anger two of my advisees and several of my students who are doing all of the filming and um, yeah please thank you. <laughs> everything, everything that I'm going to talk about I guess can be, can be summarized by uh, the work that the students and that Marcy Hull and that Doug Herman, the teachers who are with them today, are doing today, which is they are authentic agents in a national, if not international, discussion on what we need to do in education. 16 and 17 year olds, they are here, they are part of the discussion, and their voices matter, right? I mean, no matter what else we talk about today, that's what it's about. So I'm going to talk about, um, somebody needs to start that clock, because if you don't, I'm going to go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about creating the schools we need, right? Hopefully taking all these incredible ideas and say, what, is we st what do we still need about school? Because I'm just going to go ahead and say, I love school, right? I know that there's people saying, we need to not talk about reinventing school. We need to talk about reinventing learning. No, I mean, I love school. Let's, let's build a place where we can come together and learn. So I want to talk about what it might look like. Um, why this stuff matters to me. Um, these are my children. Um, the Mickey Mouse, that's Jacob, uh, the guy with the glasses, that's Theo, um, they're watching right now with my wife, which is really neat and wonderful, um, and uh, it, I want them to have amazing schools, I want them to be learners, I want them to love the acquisition of knowledge, and, and I want them to look forward to that every day, and I fear greatly that they won't. I fear greatly that never in their, 18, you know, in their 13 years of K-12 education will they experience a day like today where they walk out going, oh my God, my head hurts. It's so full of ideas. And I want that for them. Maybe not every day, because this would hurt after a while. <laughs> but I want them for that. I want that for them desperately. And we need great schools. The other reason this matters to me is that these are also my children. Um, this is the first class of the Science Leadership Academy. 110 families sent us their children when we didn't even have a building yet. They said, yes, we will buy into this crazy, wacko idea that no one else in the city of Philadelphia has, and we will send you our children. If you ever want to be humbled, have that experience. And, and the thing is, and for all of us who are in schools, yeah, it's amazing. We had this incredible experience. We started a school together. But you know what? No matter what school you're in, Parents send us their most precious resources every day. They send us their children. And they say, please, take good care of them. And, and, and that has to drive us. That has to make us better tomorrow than we were today. That is the most important. I, I just can't imagine a, a greater sense of trust that we are given. So here's the problem, though, right, which is that, that the world in which we live in is, is just crazy today. I call it the maddening paradox of education 2010. Because on the one hand, we have the ability to do things we have never done before. I mean, this was just, I walk around all the time with a camera at SLA, just, you know, or my iPhone, just taking pictures of the stuff I see. Um, this was just an everyday, this was just a science dissection. It's just, a, you know, they're, they're dissecting a grasshopper. But they've got the, you know, they've got the, the, the digital microscope and they're pulling it into their laptops and they're going to put that into the lab report, which then they're going to post online, which then they're going to share. You know, and I hated biology in ninth grade or tenth grade because um, I had a draw and I'm a horrible artist, and it turned me off to biology. And these kids are just taking this information and using it and sharing it and doing incredible work with it, and yet nobody cares unless they can pass the test, right? And, and, and let's go ahead and say this. I don't know that technology helps you pass the test. I don't. But I know that it can help you learn, and that's what I care about. You know, because the problem is this, is that is, you know, we live in this era and you hear this, you hear this phrase all of the time, data-driven decision-making, data-driven decision-making. Data-driven decisions assume you use good data, and the data we use stinks. Yeah. 
Standardized testing is cheap and it's easy, but it's not good. And the fact of the matter is we have incredible work. We have the work the kids do in our classes every single day. Why would we trust what someone else put on a test, a bubble sheet, that they took on one day of the year? Better than what we see with our eyes every day. Why do we allow that? Because, you know, and, and to get it even further, and I love this image because you can take it so many different ways. You know, we had, now we're talking this national standards movement, national standards. We're never going to get past reading and math and national standards because they're the only things that are not controversial. You really see this nation as divided as it is, ever passing history standards? We couldn't even pass science standards. You think the evolutionists and the creationists and the intelligent design people are going to tell us which ones were to follow? So we stick with reading and math. And in our cities and in our places where they're not passing the test, they're stripping art, they're stripping history, they're stripping gym, they're stripping everything out just to give them reading and math test prep so that way we can pass a test. And you know what? That's not education, that's training. And what are we training them for? We're training them for the 21st century workforce. We need the 21st century workforce. Man, I want the 21st century citizen. If we shoot for citizen, we will get the workforce we need. If we shoot for citizen, not only will we get workers, but we'll get, we'll get husbands and wives and friends and neighbors and politicians and activists and scholars. But if we shoot for workforce, we're going to get training. And we need to do better. To do better, we've got to tell a better story. We've got to have vision. So what I'm going to talk about now is what we've done at SLA. All of the things I'm going to talk about have systems and structures that live in our school each and every day. And it's about what we've built. And it's about the incredible work that students and parents and teachers have done together. Um, before I get to that, it's important to talk about why. right? And this is the Alvin Toffler quote. Again, someone who I think, as Dan said, has paid his dues. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And to prove this point, this is a picture from the Slide Rule Museum, right? <laughs> How many people in the audience will cop to having learned math via a slide rule? OK, a couple of us, right? And the fact of the matter is that last teacher who gave up, you know, who was probably the last one to give up teaching by slide rule was probably an amazing slide rule math teacher. But the fact of the matter is, is that they were unwilling to unlearn and relearn. We have to be willing to unlearn so much of the things that we understand about education because the fact of the matter is the world is different, <laughs> right? You know, my son, you know, Theo is three years old. The first thing he does in, you know, in the morning is he wants to play on the iPhone, right? He wants to play on the iTouch, so much so that we had to get that when I bought a new computer on the education discount, we got one. And I was like, yeah, he's not going to break my phone. Um, I can do that better myself. Um, <laughs> You know, my kids want to be interactive. The fact of the matter is, is that staring at a TV screen isn't their idea of play. Fortunately, their idea of play is still running and throwing and doing all of those wonderful things, but they also want something they can interact with. They want to be able to get information on their own. They want to be able to do all that stuff. They're three and five. What are they going to do when, they, you know, when Theo hits school? The other thing, so how do we get there? The first thing we do, and, and again, you know, it was in the intro you talked about, it, we've got to build caring institutions. If we take nothing else out of today, I ask you to take this. If you are a teacher, change your language. When someone says, what do you teach? Don't say, I teach English, or I teach art, or I teach math. Say, I teach kids. I teach kids math. I teach kids physics. I teach kids English. The difference when we change our language matters. Children should never be the implied object of their own education. It's about them. It's not about the stuff we teach. It's about whether or not they learn the stuff we teach. And that is all the difference in the world. I think the other thing that schools need to be are places of great inquiry. The most important thing we can do is ask rich, powerful questions and then seek out the answers to those questions. Right? It's not about, hey, I've got all this information that I want to download to you. It's exactly about that idea of discovering the information. Now, that doesn't mean we just hand them the blank sheet, because the blank sheet can be terrifying. It means helping them. It means scaffolding them. It means guiding them and teaching them that motion from guided inquiry to open inquiry, so that the, by the time they leave us, they are fully realized in their ability to take a question fully to fruition, so that they are ready for that 20% of their day to be just exploration. We've got to understand that it's got to be student-centered. Right? And, and that, that's one of those edu-speak terms that has lost meaning because they think that that means play, you know, they think that that just means that, oh, you know, kids get some time or something like that. No, it's about their work. It's about their learning. It's about their processes. And it's not about you. Right? And yet, despite that, those folks who would say that we don't need teachers anymore are, are the most wrong people out there. Kids need adults. 
badly, desperately. Every teacher has had that moment where they knew that there was a child in their class, every good teacher, I guess, that they were closer to than their parents, that they were the adult in their lives that mattered. And many of us in this room are in this room because of a caring teacher. Kids still need mentors. The world is bewildering. The flow of information, you know, the drinking from the fire hose metaphor, it's happening to them too. They need people to help them make sense of the world. But to do that, we have to help be willing to access their world. You know, it's why we shouldn't block Facebook. Because the fact of the matter is, is that Facebook should be a teachable moment. It doesn't mean that we've got to be, you know, it doesn't mean that we've got to make them friend us. Right? <laughs> Friend's your teacher now. <laughs> but if they want to let us into that world, and some of our kids do let us into that world, we should go there. And we should help them. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the digital footprint that you leave today matters. And if we don't help them make sense of that world, just like we have to make, help them make sense of math and make sense of Hamlet, we're doing them a disservice. We also have to understand that the world, that the schools can be community-based now, and here's where we can really leverage the tools that we have at our disposal. The fact of the matter is, is that if you're reading a book in a class of a living author, and you don't call the publisher and say, hey, are they willing to do a half an hour Skype call? You're doing a disservice. Bring the world into your classroom and let your classroom live in the world. That should be a two-way street. For years, schools were black boxes. They happened during work. So the most that we know of school is the occasional moment when we go out to a field trip or parents come in for a basketball game or a parent-teacher conference. That doesn't have to be that way anymore. We can involve the whole community and we can define community as narrowly or as broadly as we see fit. Schools need to be collaborative because synthesis works. My idea is better because it interacts with your idea and is changed. The fact of the matter is, is that when we allow our ideas to be playful, when we are, allow ourselves to, to interact with the minds of others and the ideas of, of others, we grow. And yet too often, still in schools, we're putting the desks in rows and we're putting our heads down and we're just reading from that one book and we're never letting our ideas live. We've got to let kids work together. We've got to let kids and adults work together. There's an amazing thing about SLA. What you're seeing in this picture, this is during Educon, but this is the, the main office table. And it's never empty. And it's never just teachers. It's teachers and kids and administrators and parents and, it's just, and visitors. And it's just where we hang. But the fact of the matter is, in that space, sometimes it's silly and playful. Lately, there's a lot of puzzles that are done there. I don't know why. But in that space, we learn together. And in all of our spaces, we learn together. I also think schools need to be places of great passion. And I don't mean what happens in hallways in our, class, in our high schools sometimes. I mean places of incredible passion for the work that we do. This is Lonnie Mercado. And what he is doing is he is cutting sheet metal to build the first ever flow process biodiesel generator because a caring teacher who had an idea and 30 kids worked on something that had never been done before, and now they have a patent pending on it. And here's where it gets really cool. This is seven times more efficient, what they built, than the standard way biodiesel is built. They gave it away Creative Commons. If you were going to use it for nonprofit purpose, they gave it away. We know of a village in Guatemala and a village in Ecuador that took what our kids had built and went from buying diesel for their, to power the electricity for their schools to actually powering their school's electricity simply by the crops that they had and the work of our kids and what the people in that village and the students in that village built. <laughs> this happens when we dare to ask the question, what if high school wasn't just preparation for real life? What if we honored the work of the kids and said high school is real life? I also think the day needs to be more integrated. The eight period shifts 70 zillion times a day. I don't know how they do it. I tried it. Right before we started the school, I went to a, tr a traditional high school in Philadelphia that's a phenomenal high school. It's an incredibly well-known magnet. Eight period day. By the end of the day, not only could I not remember what the actual stuff that was taught first period, I couldn't remember what class I had. We've got to make the day make more sense. Classes can't be silos, they've got to be lenses. We need longer classes that meet fewer times so kids have the time to play with ideas, so they have time to get down to work, and then so they can see, we can build those essential questions, we can build those themes, so that when you're studying genetics in a biochemistry lab and you're looking at how you become who you are, you're reading Hamlet, and you're asking yourself, how does he become who he is? And you're studying African American history, and you're looking at how does a people define themselves? Because identity is a powerful theme. And then the day makes more sense. 
What you're looking at, by the way, is a, is a collaborative project between an art class and a science class. When they were studying the periodic table of elements, they were learning screen printing in art. And what this is, is a screen print of titanium. And then the kids had to go back to science class with the work that they did in art and define why they chose to represent it that way and how it actually showed the science that they had learned. We can make the day make more sense. We can help kids actually draw those connections out. Just like George was saying, right? Connective tissue, make connections, it's powerful. And with all of that, schools have got to be about metacognition because any given fact or figure or thing that you teach is not as important as helping kids learn how to think for themselves. Right? Maybe we remember when the Magna Carta was signed, maybe we don't. Maybe we remember all of those things and maybe we don't. But if we can learn how to think, and if we can learn how we do it well, then we can do powerful things. And I think that technology these days must be like oxygen, ubiquitous, necessary, and invisible. It's got to be everywhere. It's got to be important. And then we've got to stop talking about it so much and just use it as the tool. Right? No one here thought, ooh, I'm going to now do a laptop project when you pulled out your laptop to tweet something. You just did it as part of your process. Why do we treat it differently in schools? Neil Postman said it best. He was talking about uh, the Gutenberg printing press. And he said, when the Gutenberg printing press was invented, you didn't have the Europe you always had plus books. You had a whole new Europe. It was a truly transformative technology. Yet in the, so many schools in America and all over the place, we, didn't, we don't have whole new schools. We have the schools we've always had plus some technology. And what we need are whole new schools. The technology should allow us to redefine everything. And what it really allows us to do is it allows us to create, research, collaborate, present, and network in all kinds of new ways. Yes, schools have done some of these things for a very long time, but now we can do them like never before. I am the son. I make so much sense. I am the son of a teacher and a union lawyer. Right? I am, I, I, none of my ideas are my own. They are all my parents. It's really kind of sad. I am the most derivative human being ever. <laughs> but in the 1975, in Camden, New Jersey, my mom was doing autobiographical filmmaking with a group of kids in Camden. No one had ever asked them their stories before. And they were cutting the film. And it took forever. And the final products were meh. And it was so easy to shoot down a progressive idea because the tools weren't there yet. Think about what the eight kids who are doing, who are here today are broadcasting. Think about how it was seamless. And think about the power of what we have at our disposal and how we sell it short in so many schools so often. So the question is, is how do we change the world? Because the fact of the matter is we've got all this ability and then we're stuck in a system right now that quite frankly stinks. So let's talk with the time that we have left about how to change the world. The fact of the matter is we must be humbled by the task in front of us. We have to teach kids. I am awed by what they walk in the door with every day. When they tell me their stories, and they tell me what's going on, and then they try to go to class and learn, I am awed by their effort. And I am awed by what they face. And I am humbled by all of the times that I don't know how to help them. And yet, there are so many people on the education spectrum now who say, well, we know all we need to know about, about teaching and learning. To which I say, please tell me, because I don't. Let's be humbled by all that we do not know. And let's be skeptical of those who are not. Let's keep asking questions. Again, if inquiry is good for kids, it's great for us too. Let's keep asking hard questions. And for the journalists in the room, let's go after the people who give us easy answers. What's going on in American education right now is a travesty. And we settle for the easy answers, and we settle for the sound bite without asking the harder questions. Let's ask the hard questions, and let's demand the answers. Let's continue the conversation. Today is amazing, and the fact that we are here together is awesome. The fact that there have been thousands of people watching is awesome, but we've got to take it back. What I dare all of us to do is go back to school. Go back to where you live and meet with parents and teachers and kids and administrators and invite your state senator or state representative to come join the conversation. Get 100 people together. What if we had 1,000 conversations in cities and towns all over this country, not where we said, how do we fix education, but how do we dream about what we want our schools to be? Could you imagine? We're not going to outspend those folks who say that we're going to monetize education, we're going to market force education, we're going to test our kids to death. We're not going to outspend them and we're not going to out-PR them. The only way we make the change is when we demand it. Because kids know something is wrong, parents know something is wrong, teachers know something is wrong. We've got to empower the kids. We need their voices in the mix. We need them saying, no, I will not be taught that way. 
I demand a better school. We need to give them that empowerment. It is their education, and it will be their world. They deserve a voice in their own education. We also need to be learners ourselves, and we need to be willing to be transformed. I am always shocked and dismayed when I hear people talk in the language of education about how schools must be transformative for kids, and yet we never talk, or not enough talk, about the idea that schools must be transformative for us. How dare anyone think that you can transform a child if you are unwilling to be transformed yourself? So it's time to organize. I, like I said, I'm the son of a union lawyer. <laughs> and I don't mean a teacher's union, I mean all of us together. Administrators, teachers, parents, students, all of us together. If not me, then who? And if not now, then when? The kids are waiting for us. They are asking us to help them lead, and they will go with us. If they believe that we will have courage, so will they. They need us. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the world is different. And the most important thing that school does, that teachers do, that we do in this age of Google, we have one last thing to teach. It is the thing we have always had to teach, and that is wisdom. Thank you so much.